you know that when the West Falls travel, <laughs> bad things happen, you know. So we decided we were going to have the all good experience vacation to finish up the summer. So we decided we weren't going to be on the boat with, uh, you know, the Webbers, but um, that was too classy. So we got an invitation from Princess Cruises uh, that a inside dark confining cabin had opened up at the last minute and we could have it really cheap on five days notice. So I went, the Lord is leading. <laughs> so, so, so we went, and you know how I often say that, that uh, the, the church is at its worst is like a cruise ship. They're aimlessly drifting in the water with way too much food and stuff and, and people complaining about the slow service. You know, that, that's basically the way it's with the church is at its worst. So we're going along and everything's fine and it's a totally uh, nothing bad ever happens kind of cruise. We got to every port the day before them and left notes on the dock for them, you know. We left most things for you and uh, that sort of stuff. And, uh, and Friday, we're uh, chugging along on our way to Victoria, where we're going to have four hours in the evening to spend in that beautiful city. Um, and I sent out a, an email on Facebook saying, if you want me to pick up any crumpets for you, you know, just let me know, because I'm chugging into Victoria. And I look kind of out the window, and I go, you know, I think we're on the seas where our ship sank a few years ago with Randy Roller and Bruce Larson and me, and, and the ship went down, and we had to be rescued in a very dramatic uh, thing and almost died. And, um, and I thought, wow, this is great. Look, at this is where, right where we were. And suddenly, the captain came on the intercom and said, we're stopping the boat. We're turning around. There's a small vessel with three men on board that is sinking, and we're going to go try and find them. And um, I thought, wow, I'm on the right boat this time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Finally, I'm on the rescue ship, not the one that's sinking, you know. <laughs> Woo! This is good. But uh, uh, now here's what happened. So, you know, we did chug back, and then the captain came on and said, uh, sorry to let you know that the boat has sunk, uh, but we're still going to go. We're probably 18 minutes away. We're still going to go and see if we can, can be part of a rescue. And I know from our experience that you die in about eight minutes in the water. So um, it was a very tense thing. You know what happened on the cruise ship? The people behind me who were griping and complaining about their, they didn't like the way that the lobster was cooked the night before on the formal night. They not only didn't like it, but there wasn't enough of it. <laughs> Which is really, <laughs> this is terrible and the portions are so small, yeah. you know. So um, suddenly the whole boat changed its temperament. Nobody was worried about their stuff. Uh, everybody was concerned about the people who were sinking uh, and floating out in the open sea. And, um, and even the workers the waitress in the coffee shop uh, said, I'm, I'm not paying attention to the customers right now. I'm just praying for the, for the men that were lost, as were many, many people on the boat. So I went up above, and, um, and Eileen and I were praying for them, and she had a lot more faith. I was just kind of praying, you know, help their family get over the grief, you know, because <laughs> I just, <laughs> it's the way I think, you know, but... <laughs> The, the actual, out on the boat, the cruise ship was like this in the water because 3,000 people were over on the starboard side looking. And, uh, and so anyway, it turns out the Coast Guard helicopter came in and we got there just as they did and were able to rescue the men and they were okay. It turns out they had wetsuits and so that gives them an extra few minutes, you know, and uh, it saved their lives. And they were rescued and, uh, and we felt like we were part of something. And even though we only had two hours in Victoria that night, from basically 9 to 11, nobody complained. Not a single person that I hear complaining, well, why'd they do that? You know, it was all, I'd gladly give up that for what happened, to be part of something meaningful, something that matters, yeah. and something that, that actually is significant. 
And I thought of the church. Right at that moment, I thought that is exactly when the church changes from cruise ship to rescue vessel. When we realize the need so apparent around us and that we are, for whatever reason, however God planned it, we are strategically near enough to be called into action, right? In people's lives and in a community and a school and uh, wherever we go. And, and I thought, how do we miss that so much? So I want to uh, have us look at a passage of scripture this morning that, you know, I have a confession to make. I probably preached on this 50 times, not this week, but um, <laughs> it's one of those passages that just calls out to be preached. And so in my life, I've done that. Uh, it's Proverbs 3. Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they'll prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and people. And then here's the verse I want you to focus on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Lord, teach us from this. How can we uh, recognize you in the different paths that we go and in the places in our life? And how can we learn to trust you and not ourselves? Uh, give us understanding today and give us uh, your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this passage because it, it, it's God saying, let me show you what matters, right? Let, let's just look at what matters. There's a lot of frou-frou around and there's a lot of peripheral things that, that it's easy to get distracted looking at, but when it comes right down to it, what matters? What makes a difference and what shapes our life? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Um, you know, I think that every one of us, you've heard me say this before, every one of us have, have a next step that, that we are, need to take. God looks at our life, we look at our life, and we go, okay, it's okay where it is, or it's not very good, or whatever it is. But we all have a step to take. It's not just others, it's us. And, and for each one of us, that step may be a little different. So for, for some of us, it's, it's a step of ma making a commitment to Christ, of, of just saying, I'm going to go from being your average regular guy uh, or gal to um, I'm actually going to say yes to Jesus and let him uh, come into my life and begin to shape me into his image. I'm going to take that step. That's a huge step to take. And uh, that's where you go from being a good American to being a follower of Jesus, which is radically different things uh, another although you know we, we might have a relationship with Christ but we still have a step to take you know I grew up thinking that well if you just accept Christ your life everything's perfect you don't need anything else it's the one decision once you've made it your life is great and then I looked around and went how come all of our lives stink so bad <laughs> you know, we're all Christians what's wrong and we realize it's because we have another step to take and and that has to do with are we going to actually trust God instead of trusting our instincts and our experiences and our uh, insights? And, um, and this is where our habits are broken, our, our patterns are interrupted, our way of doing things uh, gets stopped. And we, we look at life differently and we look at each other differently and we look at the Lord differently and we say, okay, I'm not gonna do what I usually do. I'm not gonna say what I usually say. I'm going to take a step of trusting God instead of my own way of handling it. Um, I think that's a little bit of what happened on a cruise ship on Friday afternoon. Everybody had, for a week we'd been on there griping about something. <laughs> you know, this is so popular, why are there so many people, you know? <laughs> uh, we had any time dining and others wanted to come at our time. 
I mean, the, you can't believe the smallness of what people complain about on a cruise ship or a church, you know. <laughs> Not this church, I'm talking about, you know, you know what churches I'm talking about. You put your own names on them. But, but what happens is when we, when we begin to focus on, on the Lord and say, okay, we're going to take a step to trust in God and not our usual way of doing things, it interrupts our patterns. We look differently. And when they hear the announcement, no, their boat sank and they're floating in the open sea and we're chugging there to get there. Pagans probably started praying. <laughs> you know, uh, who cares about anything else? Because, because now if the Lord doesn't act, there's nothing we can do. Our, our way of doing things doesn't really work. It's, and, and I think that's the step of growth that, that we need to take. Another step we need to take is, is what I call the step of adventure. And that's where, where we start to look at the people around us and we realize, you know, there is a world of opportunity for God to do something. If we just look at people uh, through the eyes of love and through the eyes of the Lord and say, okay, Lord, what would you have happened here in this situation? What would you have happened in this family? What would you have happened in this, in this neighborhood or in this person? And, and not just react the way we would normally react. Um, and, and I, you know, I confess, you, you know me, I, I'm a reactor. I have a certain way, I have a Westphalian way of looking at life and doing things and everything. And, it, and it's so good for me when God interrupts and says, okay, quit the Westphalian thing, John. That's what he says to me. Um, why don't you trust me here and, and let's look at this differently. And you know what I think? I don't want to. My weirdness has served me this long. Why change? Right? Same, same way you'd respond. And God goes, well, I know it has served you not that well. Why don't you try my way? You know? And I have to go, oh, Okay. So I actually thought about that today when we were singing that song, Lift Up Your Eyes, Lift Up Your Eyes, you know, and I was singing it with my head down, prayerfully. I lift up my eyes, I lift up my eyes, you're the giver of life. And all of a sudden, it, it was like God went, Westfall, look up! <laughs> well, no, I sing prayerfully, Lord, no, look up! <laughs> You know, it's like the people who close their eyes and saying, open my eyes, I want to see Jesus. You know, when their eyes are closed, you know. I, Sometimes we just have to look up and, and, and see differently. And, um, and then we can begin to trust the Lord with all our heart. Now, the, the key to this is, and they go right together. Uh, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I've actually seen plaques in Christian bookstores that have that little verse on there. Proverbs 3, 5, A. They always have a little A next to it. Right? You've seen that? And it's on the little redwood plaques, you know. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So I look at the scripture and I go, well, hooey. That's a Hebrew word. It, <laughs> that's not what the verse says. Is it? It doesn't say trust in the Lord with all your heart. Put this on a plaque. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's the verse. Because it's impossible for us to trust in the Lord with all our heart as long as we're depending on our wisdom and resources and abilities. Boy, that goes against my instincts. I think I'm going to go buy the plaque that just has the first half of the verse. Because I like that better. Right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and keep doing things your way, the way you always have. Keep handling stuff. You know, keep treating people the way you always have. Because then you don't have to really trust in the Lord with all your heart. You just have the plaque. So I don't think it's possible to trust in the Lord as long as we're leaning on our own understanding. I wish it weren't so. But I think God's word is probably telling us, no. And then it says, in all your ways, everywhere you go, in all your ways, situations and all your circumstances and all your trials and all your celebrations and all your way every single area acknowledge the Lord now that's a simple word it's not you know uh, it doesn't say obey him it doesn't say in all your ways serve him it just says notice him 
Acknowledge Him. Recognize Him wherever you go. And, I, and I've taken that, uh, um, I'm actually thinking of making a commitment this fall of seeing if I can do this. You know, I, I had to do that experiment for a year where I had to be grateful. That was a tough one. And, uh, but it, it actually changed me. You know, I had to practice what I preached. Oh, that's tough. Well, now I'm going to try this one. I'm going to see if I can, in every situation, wherever I'm going, you know, uh, even if it's a stressful thing or a frustrating thing, I'm going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to recognize you here. Help me to see you. When we go and we work at the Kid Valley booth at the Seahawks game and people come up and they don't like the way the burger was or something, I'm going to go, Lord, help me here, you know? And uh, how can I see you in this crazy 60,000 people wanting their burger now deal? And I'm the front line in that battle. I don't know, Lord, help, help me see. I'm going to try that. I'm going to start making notes. I've, I'm downloading a little program for my phone that I can make quick notes on. And I'm going to have my phone with me. And uh, <laughs> Baron's going to teach me how to use it. <laughs> he looked up and went, you downloaded something for your phone. <laughs> oh, I know. <clears throat> but I'm going to try. I'm going to say, okay, help me learn. How are you in this? Where are you here? And it doesn't matter if, uh, if it's good things or hard things. I want to acknowledge him. And the, and the, the Hebrew word literally for this, you, you probably know, is yada, the, the word for acknowledge. And it's used like a thousand times in the Old Testament. And you know, yada, 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 right? Uh, from Seinfeld. Um, and what it means is, yada means to know, to know, to recognize, to acknowledge. And uh, so when they say yada, 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 they mean, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, that's basically what they're saying. And I want to do that with God. God, I know, I, I know you're here. I know you're here. I know you're here. I don't know what to do, but I know you're here. And start to claim that. And, uh, and I'll, I'll report to you back how that works. Um, and in, in the lesson in this is when we don't lean on our own understanding and we're acknowledging God in all the situations um, and we're trusting in him, our perspective on everything changes, right? Because we're seeing new things and we're seeing things differently. And you know my uh, famous, my belief uh, from, uh, from when I was a business major at San Diego State, we learned that in the absence of good information, people project crap. That's the, that's the rule in business. So if you don't know something, you assume something bleh, you know? So if you don't know something, you just make up stuff. And, and that's the rule that business operates on. We have to give good, clear information because otherwise people are going to make up their own story. And it's not going to be real. And so we need to be giving good information and, and by trusting God, acknowledging him in all our ways and not leaning on our understanding, our perspective starts to change so we don't have to project crap. I think that's the first time that a sermon has, has uh, used that phrase um, <laughs> on the internet. So <laughs> anyway, sorry, apologize in advance, too late. But what do we do? Uh, I was thinking about this. How does this now get down to real life? Because in this room, you cannot believe how much uh, hurt, frustration, stress, disappointment, uh, worry, uh, anxiety, how much is going on inside this little local neighborhood church. Not to mention you people on the internet who we know have a lot of problems, you know. So uh, there's a lot of stuff going on and there's a lot of pain. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful. I, I'm so grateful uh, for Betsy and Tim being here today from Philadelphia because uh, they were used in uh, my book, Getting Past What You'll Never Get Over, their story, although the editor wouldn't let me use the real names. <laughs> so um, I was told today that it would have been all right. Thanks. <laughs> but there they are, driving along up the coast, the east coast, up the highway, and you know, going over these hills, and they're coming up over a hill, and just as they're coming up over the hill, uh, two drag racing cars come at them, and in a split second, they're head-on collision with one of the drag racers, 
Uh, I guess somebody in their car died, or the driver died, or something. No, the passenger. The passenger his died. Cousin. Yeah, his cousin. And in that second, here you're driving along, minding your business, going up the highway on your side of the road, boom, face to face with drag racers, and now you're in a life and death situation. And, and while that passenger died, they didn't die, but it changed their life forever. Body shattered, pain all the time. Um, you can't do what you used to do, can't plan what you used to plan, can't participate. That's why it's such a miracle you guys came out and, and went on vacation on a boat, you know. And uh, you didn't have to row. That's, that's, the, that's the good news. But, um, but the thing is, you know, you guys are heroes to me because uh, there is no answer other than, well, are we going to trust God or not? That really is the question at this point. What do we do? Our life is shattered like our body shattered. It wasn't anything we did. It, this is what happened in life. Um, I've, got a, a, I've got an email this week from somebody, um, Debbie. Uh, hello, sir. Obviously, someone who doesn't know me. Uh, <laughs> hello, sir. Thank you for writing your book, Getting Past What You Never Get Over. I think you are courageous. I was wondering if you had any counsel for me. <clears throat> I grew up with two alcoholic parents, and even though my mom was sicker, I seemed to be especially wounded by my father. I keep trying to turn all kinds of people into my dad, looking for my worth and identity, and I keep getting deeply hurt. I have become emotionally attached and then feel the familiar sting of rejection. I have zero self-worth, and the lonely emptiness I feel makes me want to end my life. I fear people. They bully or betray me as if I wear a sign or something. I'm shy. I don't have the skills to defend myself. How can God heal that hole in my heart when I can't see or touch him? When prayer and Bible reading isn't enough? When I get bullied even in a Bible study? When I just want to give up because the battle hurts so much and looks so hopeless? Why can't we just go straight to heaven? Why do we have to keep hurting each other and then get sick and old like my grandma in the nursing home and hang around here? Debbie. I've got this Wednesday. I thought I'd share it with you first before I answer it so I could get really good advice from you. <laughs> I mean, what, what this, all of a sudden you go, this is a real person. This is not some phony thing. This is a real person saying, what, what do we do? And you know what? I think every single one of us could have written that note in a, in a different form, but something like that. It said, what do, we, what do we do? Why are we here? What's it matter? How are we going to get through? Right? She's not alone in this, wherever she is. And I think there is not a simple answer. There is not an easy answer because life is too difficult for an easy answer to work. I mean, I could write her back and say, well, just trust Jesus, which is probably true, but it's not meaningful, right? Yeah, I am just struck with the unfairness of our lives and the deep brokenness that, that we have. We're like the three guys out on the sea. They were okay as long as their boat was sinking, but soon it sank. Now what? And when you get to the point where there's nothing left that you can do, All we can do is trust the Lord with all our hearts. Don't lean on our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge Him. Say, Lord, help me see you even in this. Help me see you in spite of this. Help me, help me see the people around me that they're not just doing okay superficially, but there is real pain there. There's brokenness we're not even aware of. Help me to look at them 
through the eyes of love. Where are you in this? See, I think if we ask that question with sincere hearts, I think that God will show us exactly where he is in that. He said, let me show you. And let me show you where you are in this. And how we're going to go through this together. I, I'm convinced that life's not fair. And, and I know Debbie doesn't think it's fair. But it is real. Right? It is real. And we're invited to trust the Lord with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding and in all our ways acknowledge Him. So that's what I'm going to claim for myself. And that's what I'm going to claim for you and for Debbie and for all the Debbies in the world that are out there right now. And we say, Lord, you be Lord. Because we can't. So, Jesus, bring us your spirit, bring us your love and your wisdom, bring us your perspective, bring us new ways of looking at the people around us. So we do get past the surface. And we begin to see each other as we really are. And we begin to see each other uh, as you see us as what we can be. Lord, forgive us for the times we've been superficial. Or dismissive. Or just cruise ship passengers. Help us to see the, the crisis that comes up all around us. And respond appropriately so thank you for your word that keeps drawing us back to you in Jesus name Amen